Hello, and a very warm welcome and good evening to everybody. And thank you so much for joining us um, in this dialogue session, the first of its kind as part of the National Arts Council uh, Art After Dark uh, series. So this evening, um, we are going to have uh, with us um, Anthony Chin, who is a Singapore artist, uh, our wonderful guests and esteemed guests and our collaborator from uh, the Metropolitan Manila. We have the president, uh, Ms. Tina Kalaiko, as well as the assistant director of programs, uh, Mr. Daniel Devella. And actually, you know, kind of like moderating the conversation between Anthony and Tina and Daniel would be none other than Professor Lu uh, and the, um, Ento Li Hao. And so um, very quickly, um, just to contextualize the collaboration that the National Arts Council has with the Metropolitan Museum of Manila, or MET for short, MET Manila for short, um, is that in the, about a year ago, uh, we initiated a residency program uh, where we, we um, sent our Singapore artists to be in residence at the MET. And I think that there's a very significant um, uh, initiative as uh, it's the first time that we have a very formal residency program um, with a counterpart in the Philippines. But also, more importantly, it is uh, the National Arts Council's um, intention to actually be more, to collaborate more with our Southeast Asian neighbours and our Southeast Asian um, uh, cities, primarily because there is so much um, and so rich that, uh, that we could learn um, from our, our neighbours in Southeast Asia. So not to um, belabor too much uh, about um, uh, the program, um, you will hear about the program from uh, Tina, Daniel and Anthony as they, they take us through you know, their engagement and journey in this evening. Um, I will very quickly go to and, and invite um, uh, Tina and Daniel to introduce themselves first and then to um, actually give us a sense of the work that, the wonderful work that Matt Manila does. Um, and then after which, I believe that um, Anthony will come on board and uh, start, give a brief introduction, but very importantly, to tell us about his practice, as well as then to um, tell, tell us about his experience being in Manila and in residence. And of course, the whole evening is held together by our Professor Lu, um, who will then moderate the conversations um, between Anthony, Tina, and Daniel. Yeah, and definitely. And uh, uh, at some point, we will have uh, we'll invite questions uh, from the um, from the audience. So please send on your questions, and uh, and we will. The panelists will, um, as much as possible, uh, try to answer them and take them and to actually share their experiences. Yeah. So, without further ado, can I invite uh, Tina and Daniel, please? Thank you, Taitong, and thank you for having us tonight here. The, um, so, I represent the Metropolitan Museum of Manila. Uh, the partner museum in the Philippines for the of the National Arts Council for a residency program for a Singaporean artist that began early this year. Now, by way of a background, the museum offers an encompassing range of multicultural and multidisciplinary programming that reaches out to different audiences with its philosophy of art belonging to all. Over the past 44 years, the museum has developed linkages with different partner institutions, local and international museums, and art and cultural organizations, both in the Philippines and abroad. Now, while the museum has had cultural exchange programs running for some time now, we had the opportunity to structure more responsive residency programs for artists 
and four curators in the last five years. We align goals and objectives with our partners and seek the best approach that would be beneficial for recipients and the grant giving sources. So as Taitong mentioned earlier, in September of, nine, of 2019, last year, the Metropolitan Museum of Manila inked an agreement with the National Arts Council in Singapore to collaborate and select a Singaporean artist with a proposed concept that would draw from a well of resources in the Philippine setting. Anthony Chin was selected as a Singaporean artist in residence at the Met for 2020. My colleague Dan Devella headed the team at the museum that managed the NAC Met Manila Artist Residence Program and he will tell you more about this. Dan. Thank you, Ms. Tina. Good evening, everyone. I am Dan Devella, also from the Metropolitan Museum of Manila. So let me just share a brief introduction and an overview of Anthony's uh, residency with us at the Met. So next slide. Uh, this is the Metropolitan Museum of Manila. So um, we are located um, along Ross Boulevard in Manila. Um, next slide. So these are the programs, the exchange programs and residencies that we presented. Um, Ms. Tina discussed these earlier. Next slide. And a few images um, of the output of our resident artists and curators um, for our programs. Next slide. Okay, so Anthony arrived in Manila last January 12 to begin his two-month residency with the museum. Uh, the Al Volcano, which is found in Batangas province, or just an hour away from Manila, had just erupted and Anthony found a city on edge, with asphalt descending on most parts of Manila, including the airport, and the area around the museum where Anthony's apartment is located. I remember hearing the news while waiting at the airport car park and feeling anxious, Hoping, hoping that Anthony's plane would safely arrive because airlines started canceling flights left and right. I felt, I felt relieved by Anthony's first uh, WhatsApp message and we quickly drove for his apartment, driving through Ashfall. And Anthony had to stay in his apartment for a day since most establishments, including the museum, had to close until the environment was cleared of the Ashfall. He immediately set out to have a productive time and do the work that he wanted to accomplish during his day. On his first day out, uh, we, bumped, we welcomed Anthony to the museum and introduced him to the team. Our team members helped Anthony get oriented with the local art scene through introductions to his persons and by joining him in visits to galleries, museums, and other sites around Manila. During his stay, he was accompanied by members of the museum team for uh, certain research trips to libraries and other places relevant to his research interests. A member of the museum team, Eric Veles, assisted Anthony in determining a community that he can work with for his project, which he will share later tonight. So Anthony completed his residency and his work, which was unveiled during an opening talk and exhibition reception. Uh, next slide by the end of February. He went on his last research trip to Baguio City early in March, and shortly after, he got on a plane back to Singapore, just a couple of days before Manila was put under one of the strictest lockdowns in the region due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, that ends my short introduction to Anthony's residency, which was interesting as it was bookended by two crises. I hope this contextualizes the museum's role in Anthony's stay. So Anthony will now be telling us his whole story about his work and his experience during his stay in Manila for the residency. Anthony. Hi, um, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for attending the talk. I'm Anthony, the artist who received a um, residence program in Manila. Um, can we have the slide, please? Uh, next slide. So I am basically a multimedia installation artist and my works by and large reacts to geopolitical issues. Um, I guess being on this little island state void of natural resources and susceptible to external factors, it feels much like a journey navigating insecurity. 
Um, to illustrate the feeling, allow me to show you a little video clip. Next, please. I suppose this sense of um, fragility drew me to confront geopolitics. Uh, historical narratives and site responsibility became my way of reimagining. Research is part of my practice, and that informs my reactions to sites where the work is done and or displayed. Next, please. For this talk, allow me to quickly share two previous, previous work with you. Um, this first work was part of my solo in Beijing 7i Art District. Next, please. Western Pacific um, title of the solo consisted of two works. Larger than H2O is the one on the right. Next, please. It is a work that reacts to Singapore's lack of water resource and the familiar related politics around it. Next, please. The short video clip that I've shown earlier is in fact the concept behind Larger Than H2O. It is a story of a droplet of water and a little fish. As an installation, beyond looking at it from above, aka God's Eye View, I wanted to review the underbelly simultaneously. Next, please. Installation of uh, Greater Than H2O has a curtain of crystal beads surrounding the droplet of water with a tiny fish in it. Next. Going through the curtain of beads that resembles water droplets, one sees both the actual droplet of water and a projection through the droplet onto the ceiling. Next. Please play the video. So this is the God's eye view of the droplet and the, and the fish. Uh, the glow of light around the droplet is caused by the projection uh, from below it. And through that, next please. Through that, the underbelly of the fish in motion is captured in real time, projected through the water droplet itself and onto the ceiling above. Uh, the projection reveals the ripple created by the sound of heartbeat, showing what is not visible from the God's eye view. Next. Next. The second work, East of Suez, is a site-specific response to a residential area built by the British while decolonizing from Singapore. Next. Chip B Estate housed many family members of British forces and has hidden military defense capabilities for fear of being attacked by locals. Next. After taking over from the British, the estate has been kept as it was and tenanted out. So these houses uh, always receive a new coat of pain with every change of tenant. So over the years, the walls got built up with layers of paint. Next. So the walls uh, of the room was ground, dust collected as material that dates back to the period when the estate was built. That's around 1965. The dust was then used to replicate an actual 1964 to 66 British colonial medal issued in Singapore. It is a medal I got from an antique shop uh, and is issued for service during the Confrontasi. Next. This is the installation view of the room. Uh, two walls of the room were ground and the dust were placed on the floor. Of course, inevitably stepped on by visitors of the show. Next. Uh, 34 medals, number of men in the platoon of British infantry force around World War II were cast, arranged, and then installed in like soldiers and files. Next. At the end of the exhibition, reinstatement of the room was required. Um, so the dust was mixed into new plaster to smoothen the wall and painted over. Next, please. Next. Trophy is both the title of the work and the culminating show at the Metropolitan Museum of Manila 
Artists in Residence Program. Next. It's made out of a video installation and an object that reacts to the site of the Philippines. The subject of my research and work during the residency was... Next. Basketball. Uh, very long time ago, I was a college player and continued playing it twice up until maybe around five years ago. Uh, knowing its popularity in the Philippines, it, this became my subject of interest. Next. A quick search revealed that the sport was introduced into the Philippines by America. Next. Before the Americans, Philippines was colonized by Spain for 334 years. After the Philippines-American War, the Philippines was so-called annexed by Imperial America for the next 44 years till 1946. Next. The sport was a pedagogical tool. Next. The simulation was required by the colonizers due to complex reasons and purposes. Next. For the process to be deeply rooted and effective, he started an extensive program to education system. Next. I was greatly informed by these two books. Uh, ironically, I only discovered after I visited Vargas Museum in Manila that Dr. Lo and Toli Hao, author of Playing with the Big Boys, our moderator this evening, is teaching at Singapore and US. And I'm really honored that he's with us. Thank you very much, Professor. Next. Through the books, there was a sense of resistance and nationalism that was mixed into the foundation of basketball's popularity in the Philippines. Next. Title of work and exhibition points to the idea of motivation beyond the more familiar sense of victory and recognition. Next. The focus was a trophy as an apparatus that helped spread American values in the Philippines. Next. Allow me to go through the process involved working towards the culminating show uh, in the Met. Next. Research started as soon as I reached Manila, and I was hoping to discover more beyond the mentioned books. Vargas Museum and University of the Philippines were the main source of possible research material. Next. Through the research, I had chance upon a highly structured and detailed book on physical development for the Philippines. They marked out two glaring points white man's burden with extreme racism, and for the colonizers, human resource development in the Philippines was a priority. Next. It also shows the effort on physical development as a means to extract local labor resource. Next. Few trips began simultaneously. Uh, trips to various neighborhoods in Metro Manila happen almost daily. Basketball is at every turn of the road and comes in all sizes. I was even told that there may not be a clinic or school, but there's definitely a basketball court in every barangay uh, in Tagalog. It actually means a village, district, or ward. So basketball is truly a sport enjoyed by all classes of society. Next. I also observed as space changes, the rules and the moves changes. Next. This sports architecture could be multi-purpose structure for other needs, for example, as an uh, emergency sh shelter. Next. How the sport is an apparatus of election promises and most bears the name of the politician. Next. As a space, how it is central to every community in terms of geography and social activities. It is a constant form of entertainment, a reminder to stay active and a lot more. Next. Through visiting and trying to connect with the basketball communities on my own, I have realized two facts. Uh, one is that you need a link to connect with such local community, uh, mostly due to language and a bit of cultural and social differences. And uh, the next fact is that it is actually not so safe for foreigner, uh, in fact, even for local non-residents to venture into such towns. Next. So after struggling to find a basketball community to work with for the first three weeks, I was fortunate to be able to finally manage proper few works at Bagong Silang, Phase 7C. It is the single largest shanty town community in the Philippines. Next. 
This engagement with the local community was made possible through a staff that I met, who grew up here and has very kindly volunteered to be my collaborator. Eric Belez, my collaborator, is on the right here. Next. So he arranged for the boys to be involved in the project and also ensure my safety through his brother, a respected individual in the neighborhood. Eric and his brother became the critical link for me to connect with such community. Next. This working field trip opens the door to understanding basketball's role in such communities and also provided the material that depicts the concept of labor through sports, forming the central idea of the work. Next. The material collected uh, was pawis, um, which means uh, sweat, of local basketball players. It's done through shirts bought for the players and worn during the games. Next. Uh, some of the players who contributed their sweat are here in this photo. Next. The collected sweat from around 20 boys over two days, which amounted to almost seven liters, was then crystallized and used in the final work. Next. Sweat sort as a material of collective labor and physicality. Next. Um, trophy video is a two minute single channel video installation. Next, please. Uh, next. Very roughly is the sound one. Next, please. The video projection in the installation was deliberately large, adopting a monumental scale. The arm in the video belongs to a local basketball player, and the cascading white substance in the video is the sweat sort. The work depicts the pain when the sweat sort enters the wound and the blood vein of the basketball player. He attempts to corrupt an icon of victory and resistance. Through both the open wound on the arm, and also the production process. Next, please. The arm was actually filmed in a horizontal position, parallel to the ground, suggesting the fallen. Next, please. Eric, being a basketballer himself, was the arm talent. The lower right image shows the contraption made to hold the crystallized sweat salt used during the shoot. Next. Contextualizing this work, um, the video shoot was done at the University of the Philippines, in short, UP. UP was established by the American administration as part of their public school program. Next. 
The soundtrack in the video was recorded separately at the Shanty Town Basketball Court within UP, a place where the community children frequent regularly. Next, please. Trophy object is a supported item, a vintage basketball trophy I managed to source from America. Next. The trophy dates to 1946, the year Philippines gained independence from the United States. Next. The vintage trophy was dismantled. The Art Deco style Bakelite base was used as a master to create a mold. After which, the base was replicated using epoxy resin embedded with a sweat sword and the trophy reassembled. Next. The object weighed down on the 10 shirts that was used during the sweat collection. Next. The original plate on the trophy quite badly scratched up reads. Fuse of C, or State Guard 46 from the team. Next. The culminating show started with an artist talk, uh, as mentioned by Daniel just now. Next, please. The audience was a mix of local artists, enthusiasts, museum staff, and at the end of the talk, to my surprise, I was introduced to a representative from the Singapore Embassy, uh, who was kindly invited by the Met. Next. I was especially happy that half of the community that I worked with came to the event. Not only was this the very first time that they have ever entered the art museum, it is also the first time they have ever left their neighborhood and visited Manila. Next. And the boys seemed to have fun uh, being in the museum as seen in the picture on the left. Next. The residency offered two out of town field trips, one by air and one by land. Um, due to the difficulty in connecting with a community in the first weeks of the residency, I had to push this trip back and the to the final week and was only able to do a three days land trip. Next, please. Baguio. Baguio City is six hours by bus away from Manila. It's a city built on a very hilly terrain by the American forces. The city plan was modeled after Washington, D.C. and was created as a retreat for the American military force to escape the tropical heat. Next. Unfortunately, when I went there with Jason, who's from the Met, uh, Camp John Hay, the military school, teachers camp, and the city hall museum were either closed or under renovation. So it became a trip to see the city which the American has left behind. Next, please. So with this, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to NAC for providing this wonderful residency experience the team at the Met for their incredible support, making this residency a genuinely enriching experience, and Human Barracks team for organizing this talk. Thank you very much. Next, please. Salamat po, everyone. And um, now I shall hand the time over to the professor, Dr. Lo and Tuli Hao, uh, the moderator of this evening talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony, for your inter interesting discussion about your work and uh, your, you know, uh, the way you immerse yourself uh, in Manila and in the Philippines. Uh, it's really admirable. Uh, earlier today, I talked to Daniel and and Tina about your your work, and they uh, really mentioned that uh, you're quite unique because you really took the time to immerse yourself uh, in the community and not, that, not just in the museum, right? So yeah. I think that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like similar to, to what we do as sociologists. Uh, we don't also just uh, visit, uh, you know, our field, our field site, but also try to immerse ourselves in, in the community to have a deeper understanding uh, of what's going on. And I think it's admirable. Uh, you, the product of your, of your visit, you know, uh, is really, you know, a form of crystallization uh, of your uh, work uh, in Manila. So what struck me most about uh, your work is this idea of crystallization, right? So of course, the trophy is a crystallization of, of victory, but also a crystallization of struggles, of sacrifices, of pain. And so, uh, you know, it refers to this transition, crystallization of sweat into salt, 
right? So it's a very symbolic like process because there's a sense of continuity when you talk about you know artistic work. So you can ha you can just maybe just have uh, you know observe and and draw something, paint something, uh, you know, create an abstract uh, an abstract uh, artwork out of your observation. But with the salt and use how you turn the salt into a trophy it's uh, there's a sense of continuity you know in in the body of the players uh, through their sweat and the crystallization of their struggle of their labor uh, in that salt right so there's a continuity of the phys of the physical aspect of uh, of the body uh, that is manifested in the crystallized salt and that's why I'm really interested in it. And I think uh, in your work, you try to uh, replicate this, you know, crystallizing observation. So that's how you describe your work. And I think uh, it resonates well with me, especially because that's what we do uh, as sociologists, you know, as social scientists. We try to crystallize our observations. So society out there is like almost like fluid and dynamic. And so uh, we take, a, uh, we pause and, and think and, you know, uh, find something interesting and say, oh, let's stop and take a second look at it and, you know, produce something out of it uh, for, that we can share with others, right? So just like your artwork, we also produce uh, books, articles, and all this. So I think uh, art and sports is, is quite interesting. There is quite, there's a quite a strong link because as you have observed, right, the sports and art is pretty much a microcosm of society. So what is happening in larger society is something that you can see in sports, in basketball in the Philippines, and in art, right? So I think that's what's interesting about your work. But anyway, we're not going to crystallize this, uh, you know, uh, we'll make it more dynamic, more fluid with uh, our discussion. So, of course, I would like to call again uh, Daniel and Tina to share uh, in our discussion. And uh, for you out there who are uh, watching us uh, through Facebook, uh, I again I remind you that uh, you can share uh, in the exchange by typing in your comments and sending it to us. Okay. So let me pose the first question to, uh, to Anthony. So Anthony, uh, can you tell us about your experience working uh, with the community? Uh, do you think that uh, you know, it's, it's unusual for artists to really go down to the field and ask people, like asking for their sweat, right, as an example? Do you think that uh, the people readily open up to you and you know, appreciated uh, your work? you know, the, your intention in, the, in your visit to their community? Uh, I think my experience, think my experience uh, at, the, uh, at, the, at the community was, uh, the community was, was quite, was uh, initially was quite a shock for myself. Um, this is the first time I've been to Manila and definitely the first time I'm, I'm in touch with a community of this particular socio-economical status. Um, so when I was there, the first thing that was I had to confront was the fact that um, during the uh, the war on drugs, Bagong Silang was actually the first place to be hit by this um, this um, this action. So, um, but as far as bridging um, the gap with the community, I think um, Eric and his brother, um, through them and with their help. Uh, a lot of explanation that I tried to put forward to the community was uh, was handled by them. Uh, looking, judging by the amount of laughter and giggling that went on when I was collect collecting the sweat, I guess um, they, they kind of find it a strange action, but at the same time, I think they also appreciate the fact that I'm not there to um, create any sort of trouble, and I'm really just trying to um, yeah, this this material that I need to create an artwork that deals with labor. I think up to that point, they, I figured that they understood what my intention were, and uh, that that definitely helped a lot. Oh, okay.
Hi, Anthony. Sorry, there was a disruption. No problem. So uh, let me uh, ask the next question to Tina or to Daniel. And it's about the, the uniqueness of, of uh, Anthony's uh, visit in, in Manila. So I suppose you have uh, several visitors already. So what made, you know, like uh, Anthony's project uh, unique and his uh, interaction uh, with, with, you know, the staff and uh, the people uh, in, in, in the Met, right? Okay. Um, so Anthony benefited from um, an extended um, residency program relative to um, other resident artists we've had before who had intensive um, visits um, about a couple of weeks going around uh, the Philippines, immersing themselves um, in, the, in the country and the culture. Um, Anthony had two months, so um, he definitely had um, the time to expert and to um, set out and do do his research um, for the first month and then execute his um, proposal in the next month. All right, so uh, so that that's what I, I have mentioned earlier. What uh, what you know, Anthony's uh, visit uh, was uh, so special because of this like uh, immersion, his like effort to to really understand society uh, before just uh, putting on you know uh, producing something, right? So just by reading uh, books and reading articles, he could have done something, created something, but he really took the effort to immerse himself uh, in the community, and I think that this something uh, what is uh, admirable uh, again if i may reiterate it right so uh anthony uh, you, uh you, what made you decide to to work on basketball and you know uh, make it like uh, as the theme of your uh, art uh, you know your art project uh as i've explained in during the powerpoint i, I used to play basketball myself and uh during the college days uh, up, up up until a few years ago when my knees just couldn't handle it anymore. Um, so when I wanted to put in a proposal uh, for this particular residency, I, it struck me that um, this particular sport is something I'm very familiar with. And I actually have a lot of playmates who, who are from the Philippines in, over here in Singapore. So I started to do a very quick search on this particular subject. And I want, just wonder how basketball got introduced and uh, why, are the, why is it that the sport is so popular in the Philippines? And uh, so that became the starting point of the work. So uh, you mentioned labor, right? So you you talk about labor in the context of basketball. Uh, it doesn't seem to like connect well when you talk about basketball. It's about leisure. Uh, it's about fun. But uh, when you talk about labor, there's a certain like seriousness about it. So how are you going to reconcile this seemingly like a uh, different worlds? Um, actually, it was a very um, natural process that carried me from the point of looking at it as a sport, as a leisure, to um, linking it to the, the kind of discovery that I found along the way. Uh, fundamentally, the Imperial U.S. wanted human resource development done in the Philippines because they needed labor as a critical part of capitalism. So, the, and through the case study of Bagong Silang, there is a real connection between the idea of human labor, sport, and capitalism. In neighborhood like this, um, this particular sport can be a form of li livelihood and sustenance. Um, there are hidden underground um, gambling activities. That's one layer. On top of that, a lot of the players are, are in the hope of getting talent scouted um, so that they can elevate to another level of playing field and at the same time transform out of their current financial situation. So I would say that I equate this to football in Brazil. I think it's a mirror image.
So uh, I think uh, it's time to ask Tina and Daniel again uh, and ask them about uh, you know their overall assessment of uh, the, the program and uh, you know the contribution of, of Anthony's work uh, in the MA in the METS uh, project uh, residency project. So do you think uh, overall uh, it was uh, well worth it and you think that uh, another Singaporean artist uh, will possibly visit uh, again Manila to, to do another project? If I may, no? um, Anthony had a very good concept actually um, that he brought with him to Manila and Actually, I'd like to ask him a question because he the concept uh, is not really a common one. So I'd like to maybe you can share with us, Anthony, what is the reaction of the young men that you that you met, you know, and you told them that you were going to collect sweat for your art. So was it something that you tell us how they reacted to it? Oh, uh, but uh, I I feel that they, they had fun. I mean, that I think is quite definite. I'm not certain that they understood it totally. Maybe they find it strange and a bit weird. Um, but mm -hmm. I I deliberately did not kind of uh, elaborate um a lot on the details because I wanted to kind mm -hmm. of leave room to for their for the interpretation of the work. Um, mm -hmm. and so when they came to the mat. Um, to me, the important things that they saw, what they provided as labor becomes part of an artwork that is sitting in the gallery. And I think um, that exposure to art itself means something. Uh, and for me, um, I did arrange uh, a transport to pick them up from Bagong Silang, which is, you know, very far away from, mm -hmm. from the mat, and then send them back mm -hmm. home afterwards. Um, in a in a very small way as a little gesture to kind of go against that slightly um, elitist air about contemporary art. You know, because boys like them, they would have never been to an art museum. So that was the part that I, I, was, uh, I was very happy with. So that's a very interesting, uh, you know, like a statement about uh, connecting art and, and community because uh, we uh, we see this uh, museum as this uh, you know like a building with security almost like a you know like a fort but uh, in this case uh, you know you see that the uh, worth it, uh, art is worth uh, bringing to the people and there should be like more conversation more linkage between art and community i think this is uh this is like happening there has been uh, some artists and and institutions that has been doing this but uh, uh in some areas there are still a lot of things to do right in order to do this so i think uh, that's a, a good uh you know, step towards this, especially for uh, a foreigner to, to to see a foreigner visit, uh, you know, the Philippines and then not just stay in, in a museum in a secured place and really reach out to people is something commendable, right? So, yeah, so Anthony, I have another question and uh, it's quite obvious, uh, it's COVID season. Uh, you were just so lucky that uh, you were there a couple of weeks early Right. So what would have happened if, uh, you, you know, you arrive or, you know, you arrive there in, in March or in April? Uh, how would have been, you know, like, a, how would you imagine uh, your, your new, um, you know, the, the product, the artwork that you produce? If that would have happened, which means I'll be completely cut off from the access to working with the community. I think it will drast not only drastically change the the uh, intent that I had when I went there, and also I think it will break the link between this the historical narrative that I found out with what uh, with mo modernity, with what is really happening nowadays on the ground. Um, I, I thank my lucky star that that wasn't the case. Uh, COVID did not hit when I was there. Well, it started, but um, it wasn't serious. So uh, I would say uh, I thank my lucky star, really. 
Okay, so I think uh, now it's uh, thank you, Anthony. It's a really interesting, you know, uh, discussions like sharing of your experience, and I think uh, it's now time for us to open the discussion to our audience. And uh, Deborah Lim, uh, who's here, and she has been to a residency in the Philippines as well, and she has a question here: How did you feel uh, this experience feed into your continuing practice in Singapore? having started research on the different social political conditions in both countries was there a particularly memorable takeaway that will manifest in upcoming work thank you devora this is a very nice question i think i think the most memorable thing that i took away other than um working with the community um is the fact that i made quite a lot of friends when i was there uh, friends who are artists, um, friends who are, are enthusiasts. I and in particular, there are a couple of friends that I have stayed in touch with. Stayed in touch with. Um, there's no concrete plans right now as to what we're going to do together, but I think when the opportunity comes, I'm sure something will come along. So there we have another question, and for this time, for for Tina and Daniel. Uh, would you share your thoughts on how Anthony's work resonates with Manila's community of artists and audience? I think um, Anthony's work um, really like, resonated well with um, the artist community because um, I know he was in, he met a lot of artist friends as he mentioned earlier. Um, and um, this kind of um, work or social practice um, is really something that's um, being established now in Manila. And a lot of people, a lot of artists are going to the communities um, to help, especially during this time, uh, during this pandemic. So I think um, it's, it's, it's the way he did it, the way he immersed himself, himself in um, the community was very um I think productive and I think artists received it well. So Anthony, in the context of Singapore, do you think uh, you can replicate what you've done uh, in Manila and, you know, uh, uh, in Singapore? And do you think uh, you'll have uh, the same, uh, you'll have be able to capture like the same message uh, that uh, you have, uh, that you got, you know, like emerging in Bagun Silang? on the on this idea of labor uh, whether it will be another form of crystallized sort or not um, i'm not sure um, but that's definitely like um, like what daniel has just mentioned uh, artists working with communities and within communities is something that's uh, that's been happening for quite a period of time now and um, i mean great works has been created that through that method um, but my focus has always been um, looking at uh, geographical politics. So I, I guess as long as um, there's an opportunity to to express what I feel through a community on this particular subject, um, I'm definitely um, happy to, to be going into that direction. So any, uh, uh, Tina and Daniel, uh, any other questions uh, for... Yeah. For Anthony. Actually, I'd like to pick up on what Anthony mentioned earlier that, um, you know, his observation and how he was struck with how the how his collaborators actually were in the museum and enjoying themselves because it's the first time that they've been there. Actually, that was also very important. Uh, that was important to Anthony and that was also important for the museum because this is what we want to do. We want to be able to make art accessible to a lot of people. And uh, we were just as happy to see them and join us, not only to see them as part of Anthony's work, but for them to be at the museum and to, to make them appreciate what Anthony has done, you know, the artwork that he wanted to do. And maybe they couldn't understand that in the beginning when he was collecting sweat and he and they finally got to see that it was part of a video and they were all part of uh, they were collaborators of Anthony. 
So that was a major thing, not only for Anthony, but also for us. Uh, there's another question from the audience uh, from uh, Yin Lin. So the question is, uh, do you plan to build upon this work? And, and if yes, what direction will you plan to head in? What else about this subject matter on sporting history, colonialism, and labor will like, uh, would you like to explore? Hmm. Actually, the, um, the, this particular experience, um, because the field trip uh, was, a, was a limited um, field trip, um, I think if the residency was, were to be longer, um, and I'll be able to spend more time with the community, uh, maybe collect more sweat and get more salt from them. Uh, I guess maybe there will be there will be actually more works that will that will come out from it. Um, basically, what was used in the video was later put into the the trophy. So I've expanded all the material that I've collected. Um, but as far as exploring the subject is concerned, linking. Um, history, colonialism, and labor. I think it is a it's a very right topic. Um, I always I always feel that for me personally, I need to feel connected to the subject uh, for me to have a real passion with what I do. So as long as I find a trigger point and I find a door for me to access into this particular um, subject matter, uh, I'm sure new things will happen. So Anthony, uh, there's a lot of, you know, we praise, you know, how the effort to connect with the community and like bringing this, uh, uh, you know, pl basketball players into the museum uh, is quite uh, laudable, right? Uh, about having them see the product of, of their participation uh, in, your, in your work. But uh, coming, if you imagine yourself, you know, from their shoes, uh, looking at artwork and, you know, like the work that you produce, do you think that uh, uh, everything makes sense to them, or is there something that uh, you know you think that uh, like a sort of disconnect? That uh, why is he doing this? What's what's the point of coming uh, to the to Manila and just uh, collect sweat, right? Uh, coming from their perspective. Hmm. I, I can't say for certain how they would react to it, but I I, I truly believe that. Um, like any art, as long as it's um, something that's beyond the decoration, um, there, are, um, there are qualities in it that requires time for you to build up a certain level of knowledge. And then you'll be able to appreciate what you're looking at. Um, it's a bit like, um, it's like learning a new a language. You know, you have to kind of at least get to a certain level before you can appreciate how good a writer is, how good a book is. Um, so it's the same to me works in for, for art, especially for visual arts. So I hope um, with that little start at the Mets, uh, the community will continue to kind of be interested in art and uh, will further explore this particular area. Yeah, so I think uh, the I think that I asked this question because this is something that we also experience, you know, uh, like with the research that we do at the the output that we produce. It's always uh, always uh, being asked like, what's the relevance? Uh, are the people you know that uh, you engage with in your work are they able to participate it or? Are they just, uh, you know, like a, a tool uh, uh, for you to produce uh, your own, uh, you know, product, right? So this, uh, so that's why I think, uh, you know, it's it's good to to include them, but uh, we have to be more careful about like, you know, how we communicate, you know, uh, our our work, our product, and their uh, that they are part of it, right? Uh, and yet, uh, they, they somehow uh, feel that. You know, like art and 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 scholarly work and academia is is as you have said. You know, it's a, it's a dif different world, but uh, we're trying to bridge uh, this uh, two different worlds. And I think uh, uh, communication and starting a conversation is is a good way of inviting you know like more people to be to be part of our our weird world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have another question here. <laughs> Uh, from from Vince. Uh, so, how is the atmospheric air from the place you work 
compared to, to, to Singapore? What is the vibe of the community? Atmospheric air? Um, well, it, uh, frankly, Bagong Silang, uh, it, it is a very different world compared to what we can see in Singapore. Um, the, as I mentioned, the, this, the, the initial introduction that, that was given to me was um, someone mentioned to me that uh, that particular drain that we passed, just drove past when it first reached Bagong Silang, used to have at least one dead body in there daily up until like three years ago. So there is that sense of, um, there's obviously a sense of danger, but at the same time, the moment you, look, you reach that place and you look around you, you, you do suddenly feel very um, attached to the people that you are looking at, simply because you can sense that they are very, very down to earth. And to them, it's about livelihood. It's about going on with their day-to-day. -day. Um, the community that I work with, I, I know that they, a lot of them has odd jobs. And um, that's the reason why this game in itself can become a sustenance and help them uh, along the way. So um, for sure, it's very different from Singapore. But I, I do feel a warmth when I was there working with the community. I don't think they, they literally treat me as an invader or, a, or someone that's very alien. Maybe they find me strange, but definitely not, uh, not someone who is regarded as an intruder. All right, so uh, so this uh, this question about uh, like trophy, you know, uh, you have this trophy that's uh, made of salt, but then you have this another artwork, you know, the video uh, with the hand, and I just have a, a curious uh, question about like the use of the hand as a trophy, right? So the slash there is like really quite big, and uh, you're using it to to symbolize labor, right? The pain and the suffering of like basketball player and you know their their labor as part of their labor, right? But uh, why is the like the slash here? Uh, it could be you know it could mean something. It could mean uh, suicide or something like that. So yeah. So can you tell us uh, about uh, you know the symbolism behind that uh, other artwork? Um, I think. Need looking at the work, uh, we I need to backtrack a little. Um, the idea of using a race feast like this as a symbol, um, on one hand, it is a very strong icon of resistance, of struggle. On the other, it is also don't you think that something like this looks a bit like a trophy? So a, a trophy is just an object that 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 uh, rely on our interpretation and our creation to. Kind of give it a form as to as to why the slash um frankly i was very taken aback when i realized that the u.s killed more people in the philippines when they colonized um, the community for 44 years versus the spaniard who was there for 300 over years so the amount of violence is is really quite frightening and to me i had it was um it was a really a need to show uh, this kind of like sense of violence um the signal of death into the work um but of course later on when i was in in the met daniel was the one who told me that um during the spanish conquest basically Katip katipunan um the brotherhood was and the sense of resistance was actually also expressed through a slash on the arm so um but that just added um, kind of like enriched another enriched the work at the end of the day in terms of what it means and how it can be interpreted. All right, so uh, we have another question uh, related to uh, to my uh, question. Uh, it's about the trophy. So from from Darren, uh, Darren asks here, may I ask how Anthony the artwork name as trophy. So as a student, I often struggled on settling on a title that felt the best fit for my work and enjoyed, uh, he enjoyed the talk too. But uh, so what made you decide uh, to use the trophy? Uh, I, because um, like I mentioned inside the, during the PowerPoint presentation, 
I was attracted to Trophy as an apparatus that kind of um, encouraged returned effort into achieving an objective. Uh, it gives you a sense of pride. It, um, it gives you a great sense of recognition. Um, but that's the so-called the, the common understanding of what a trophy is. To me, I was more interested in the fact that then why do someone give a trophy? Why does an organization decide to present such an item to an individual or a team? So, um, to me, I think that that kind of underlines what um, the, the work that I was looking at, and um, and I thought that it was a it was a straightforward, you know, and very direct way of uh, depicting what I was trying to say. So I, I don't have a formula on how I um, title my works. Sometimes it just happens. All right. So there we have another question from uh, Aaron. So just wondering if gender. Uh, so if gender is a possible dimension that you would explore in a future iteration of the sport or alternatively, a sport played by Filipino women or both sexes? Oh, that's a, that reminds me of something that I found out. Um, they, um, through the research, I actually found out that basketball, when it was first introduced into the Philippines, it was introduced to the public school program, and it was actually initially played by girls. It was a sport that was only played by girls in the beginning. It was much, uh, I think it was much later. I think Professor is the best person to answer this question, actually, uh, <laughs> on how it later on became a very masculine uh, uh, activity. Yeah, so initially it was uh, for women, but actually the conservative, you know, Catholics uh, in the Philippines thought that uh, it's too uh, rough uh, for women, and so therefore they decided that uh, you know uh, it should they should stop. And there were issues about you know the clothes, that uh, the clothing, uh, the uniform. So initially there were the women were wearing bloomers. So bloomers is this kind of like you know something you wear under your skirt uh you know to to because of uh conservatism right but uh that uh in initial interest uh by women and participation by women in the sports actually uh, contributed to its popularity later on because when uh basketball moved to the college you know university uh inter-university games the women were able to appreciate the game and so as as fans you know even just as fans uh it really widened uh the interest you know of of the of the community that uh, it widened the fan base of of the game and contributed to its development right so i think uh yeah so this is i think this is a good question uh, about gender so when we talk about sports you know uh uh there's like about there's a lot of masculinity and you know it's about brutal strength and adversity between teams right that uh but uh, this is uh, also changing, even in the context of sports. Uh, more and more women are participating. I think all of the like events in the Olympics now have uh, women events, and so yeah. So the sports is in the for forefront actually of like uh, women's participation. Okay, so we have another question from uh, from Natalie. Uh, were the players you work with aware of the context and background of basketball in the history of Philippines, or maybe they just don't care? We just... I'm not sure actually, but I, I I I mean, if I may assume, I don't think they they did they know about this. I th I think to a certain extent, I was trying to. Um, I was hoping that they, through the work, they will ask questions like this. I mean, why is it that uh, two pieces of artwork was created and a show named Trophy based on the subject of basketball, but when you go into the space, you don't see a single ball, right? And, um, and hopefully through the text that was on the wall, they could get a glimpse of like, what I was trying to, to call out was literally the, the historical background to this particular sport and, uh, and how it, it's very different in terms of intention in the beginning versus what they 
what they are used to now. So when you were uh, there in Bagong Silang in the community, you know, did you see a spo uh, an American sports being played or did you see like a, a, like a totally Filipino game uh, that uh, people engage in? Oh, I, I would say that the, the kind of play is very, very, Philipp very Philippine style. I mean, the, like the players that I play with in Singapore, it's a lot of speed. It's a lot of before you can react, they already move. So uh, I think that's the kind of style that I encounter uh, when, I, when I observe their games. I did try to play with some of the younger boys, but uh, I'm, my body fails me, even though the intention is there. So when they were playing uh, basketball, uh, what, what were their, you know, when they idolize somebody, uh, they, they copy the game of Filipino star or an NBA star like, uh, you know, uh, Stephen Curry or somebody from the U.S.? Actually, I, I also realized that um, some of the players, they, they don't really think about American basketball um, stars, typically. They, their heroes are actually the local teams, the local players. And that's the part that I was, um, I was quite surprised. Even though you see, do see a lot of like LA Lakers jerseys, uh, Boston Celtic jerseys, and, and, uh, but at the same time, I think they are very grounded and the, the, the influence of the sport, the success of the sport in the Philippines is quite amazing. Um, to the extent like when Danny was trying to hook us up with a UP basketball team, I, then I realized that even the college players, the university players are themselves um, like superstars. So uh, I think they, the sport really is at a different level compared to most of the places that I've been to. Okay, so uh, let's go back to art because uh, uh, so I'm, I'm quite curious. Uh, you, do you think that uh, there's still, you know, like art when it comes to, to you know, using sports as a, as a theme uh, for art? Is it, do you think that it is still, you know, like limited, still like a marginalized like, field? And do you think that, uh, I think that uh, your work is quite, you know, like a really important almost like pioneering when you talk about sports and art uh, in the philippines but uh, of course uh, my awareness uh, of this field is quite uh, limited so what do you think about your place you know uh, this specific project in the overall like development of art uh, and sports wow I, I, that that is a, that's a very big subject to deal with but I, to my knowledge there are a lot of our work that deals with the subject of um, of sports uh, when it comes to contemporary art, um, and I've seen I have I myself during the research I've seen a few, and uh, you I think as an artist the first thing you need to do is to know what is out there so that you avoid what has already been done. Um, but I think as a subject, it, there's still a lot of areas to be looked into. Um, one good example is the question that was posted just now. What about, I mean, sport is very masculine. And um, so what happens when you look at sport from a, from a sexual perspective? Um, how does that create more possibilities? And um, the way I dealt with it was sport as a form of labor. Um, there's so many things around the, the subject itself, and I'm sure uh, there'll be more uh, to come. Yeah, so I think uh, the question also uh, can be, you know, uh, asked to, to Tina and Daniel. So uh, what do you think about like uh, sports as a topic, you know, uh, in, is it uh, the first time for, for the Met to, to have uh, this type of project that uh, Anthony has done or you already have some project on sports uh, before? No, I think national sports is a very common theme for many of the artists to, to paint or to, to with which they can express themselves. But for uh, specifically for Anthony's work, no, um, we were very, we were actually engaged with, uh, with the work because um, we were part of our production. And I think Dan, Dan can talk more about this, how, how Anthony coordinated with the staff in actually yeah. producing a lot of things that Dan could talk more about it. 
<laughs> well, um, there I think there are a lot of like in terms of like um executing and producing our Anthony's artwork, there were a lot of like negotiations that had to happen, <laughs> um, because of um like the specific um visual that he wanted to accomplish, um, especially with the actually um inflicting a wound on the actor for example um was a, was something that um we felt might not um be welcome to uh, a welcome idea to the actor or the collaborator so we had to like look into other options like using prosthetics or using makeup um another thing is um well the um the the production um, of Anthony's work. It's not something that we've, we've had our art, resident artists before who um, made artworks during their stay in the museum, but it was not to this extent. Um, Anthony's was the most um, well thought of, at least from my experience. Like he was prepared and he knew, he knew what he wanted to do for this project and he executed it. Even um, he prepared even before going to Manila. All right, so we have uh, another question from the audience here. So, and it's directed uh, to Tina and Daniel. So what do you think other artists will come and explore for your future residences? Oh, we welcome great ideas. We welcome great ideas and new ideas, especially, you know, at, at, at this time. The goals are very clear for, for the residency, but, um, Things also have been happening that uh, will greatly affect probably the formatting or the timing. So, and, and maybe the the very concepts no, that will be presented for, for the next residencies might also be affected by what is happening. So we are really looking forward for, for more artist proposals no, where the museum can really help with uh, their process and uh, with their art production. Right, so uh, for, for Anthony, uh, so what will this uh, project uh, lead to? Uh, can you give us like, uh, you know, some idea about your future project and will it be related to sports still or? Do you think that uh, your experience in Manila has opened like uh, new uh, ideas for you, new inspiration for your next work? Um, yeah, as I mentioned just now, I think I think what I managed to take away, which is very important for me, are all those friends that I, I've met. Um, as of now, there's no concrete plan of exactly um, how I could work with them, but I'm sure somewhere around the line, something will happen. Uh, as long as the relationship is kept. Uh, as far as colonialism and sport or the graphical politics and sport, I, I believe there are a lot of subjects that I can dabble with. Um, however, I would, like I mentioned just now, as long as, as I'm personally attracted to it and I feel passionate about it, I will definitely uh, create something out of it. Yeah, so I think uh, it's, it's a good... Uh, you know, uh, points that uh, we've raised in this uh, discussion. Uh, there are several uh, things that I want to highlight before I pass on uh, the, the floor to, to Taitung to close the program. I just want to highlight uh, the different like uh, points, uh, different lessons that we've learned, uh, even as uh, have learned from learned something uh, from what from Anthony's experience, uh, his visit to Manila. Uh, I think uh, one of the key, uh, you know, points uh, that is really important is how art uh, is about. Uh, you know, like bridging art, uh, making art for the people and like not just making people suffering labor as the subject of artwork, but also like getting them involved, involved in the production. Right. So I think that's a very important, like a key step uh, that Anthony has made. And second point is the production sometimes uh you know like artwork the final product is uh is important of course but the process of producing that uh is also uh you know uh key and so like 
for instance, like Anthony's effort to really immerse himself in the community is uh, something uh, that is important, uh, something that, you know, uh, will inspire other artists, right? Uh, especially if you want to highlight, you know, um, like people's suffering, people's experience, uh, because art is supposed to be uh, Often, you know, some arts like glorify uh, those who are in power, but often art is seen as a statement uh, against the status quo. And with uh, what, uh, you know, Anthony did, uh, immersing himself uh, in the people, like I think that the message here is quite convincing, right? So, and I think uh, those are the two important things when, uh, we know, when I think about Anthony's visit and uh, the key lessons that we can take out of this uh, conversation, right? So now let me pass on uh, the, uh, you know, the responsibilities, the, the ball. Let me pass the ball, if this is basketball, to Taytong for the last two minutes. <laughs> final words. <laughs> well, um, well, guys, this is not the end of the ball passing. You know, hearing you know what this um, wonderful conversations that we had, and uh, definitely thank you so much to uh, to Anthony, Daniel, Tina, and Lou. You know, for for really um, moving this conversation. But I think what was most um, touching for me in a way um, during as we go through this COVID-19 situation um, is that how humanity um, connects regardless of our geographies, regardless of our cultures and, uh, and definitely, you know, um, hearing the experiences uh, from both um, Anthony and the Met Manila it is very uh, encouraging for the National Arts Council to want to continue to create such connectivity um, between artists um, around the region in Southeast Asia, definitely to deepen our relationship and collaboration with the Philippines, um, and to actually hopefully to see how this kind of uh, um, cross cultural, cross-geographical conversations um, can continue. And I think that the, the, the work that Anthony did in terms of with the community through this uh, most, um, when, when I first heard about the proposals of basketball and, 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 and artwork, I was immediately very curious. And I was th also thinking like, oh, how is this going to pan out? Um, and clearly, um, the, 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 the seriousness of, uh, of, of, and the commitment that Anthony gave to this particular project has yield much um, in terms of not just having a, 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 a good outcome in terms of a physical artwork, but also about bringing to us as we listen um, the the, 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 the most interesting nature of how community functions and how art um, cuts across, um, like how Tina say, cuts across all social layers and that there's always that sense of resonance. Yeah, so thank you, thank you, thank you once again to um, the four of you who has kept this wonderful conversation going, um, who has made it very possible um, uh, for, for the Arts Council to, you know, do this inaugural digital version of Art After Dark. Um, and so, to our audiences out there, um, if you enjoyed tonight's program, so there'll be more coming up in November. So do check out the Gilman Barracks um, social media pages for updates um, for the full lined up of Art After Dark. Um, and uh, we would appreciate very much if you could provide your feedback and comments on the session through a very short online survey. Um, and the link and the code uh, will be shown at the end of this uh, broadcast. So we would love to hear from you. We want to know what we can do better. We want to hear um, ideas and suggestions because the the 
Art of the Dark, Gilman Barracks and the Arts Council is about um, is about um, the encouraging the appreciation of art and also encouraging more participation in in art. So um, it only leaves me to say thank you again to our speakers and Professor Lu, who, who wonderfully weaved, you know, the, the, the very, the, the, who kind of like took us on a very smooth journey through this uh, terrain. And then, of course, uh, a, a warm thank you to our audiences who were with us for the, more than an hour. So thank you. Good evening. And uh, we see you soon at the next Art of the Dark um, uh, uh, event. Yeah, thank you. Good night.